Great, thank you very much um, for inviting me to speak. Um, so um, first I'll start with some background um, for the context of, of what I'm discussing. Um, so I start with a pair of connected reductive algebraic groups. And I want these to be um, Langland's dual to each other. So um, they have dual root data. And then the, the guiding insight um, is the following. The, um, the affine Hecke algebra has two manifestations. So one of these is um, in terms of G's information and the other is in terms of information related to G check. Um, so I think the affine Hecke algebra um, won't really show up um, except in its categorical um, incarnations for the rest of this talk. But um, I want this to be the affine Hecke algebra associated to the affine vial group, uh, meaning I take the finite vial group, say associated to G, um, and then semi-direct product with the, using the usual action on the coate lattice um, associated to G. So, so these two um, categorical incarnations, um, on the G side, this is in terms of some constructible sheaves so these um, these constructible sheaves appear on the on the variety in the title, known as the affine flag variety. So this is G, but then you extend your scalars to the Laurent series, and you mod out by um, what plays the role of a Borel subgroup um, called an Iwahori. So this is the affine flag variety. And this is the geometry that, that I want to deal with. And so this is, um, of course, not finite dimensional over the complex numbers, but instead we regard it as an end variety and it's end projective. So it's an increasing union of finite dimensional projective varieties. Um, it can be disconnected depending on your G. So um, the number of components um, will depend on the size of the fundamental group of G. Um, and of course the Iwahori orbits, um, there's a Bruja type decomposition. So the Iwahori orbits are indexed exactly by the um, affine vial group. All right, and so um, on the space, the thing that I want to study is um, this category with lots of decorations. Um, so the bounded derived category of K sheaves, I want sheaves of K vector spaces on the affine flag variety. And then um, I want these to be constructible. So the cohomology sheaves of a complex to be constructible. Um, and then also Iwahori equivariant. So that's the category that I want to consider. Um, and this category comes with a um, monoidal structure. Um, called convolution and if you're familiar with sheaves, then you know that you can push and pull them along um, algebraic maps between spaces. Um, if you're uh, less comfortable with sheaves, then you can think of functions here and do similar types of operations. Um, so this convolution isn't so, um, you just need to accept that it exists, but here's the way that it gets defined 
um, for those of you who are more inclined towards this type of geometry. Um, so I have a product of flag variety. So this is where I start with my two sheaves, um, but I can build a sort of twisted product instead, um, like so. And then once I have this twisted product, then I can, I'm allowed to multiply because now I have something in the, in the group. So I have a multiplication morphism towards um, one copy of the affine flag variety. Okay, so what you do is you start with your pair of sheaves here and you pull them back pull them back along P and this lands you here in the middle. And then I can look for something that this is a lift of. So this is, this has to be the pullback of something. Um, and this is a consequence of the equivariance. And so then your convolution is defined to be take that something and now push it forward along your multiplication. All right, so in any case, this um, we have this convolution. And so oftentimes um, this category together with its convolution is called the, um, the affine HECA category. And the reason for that is because it categorifies the affine HECA algebra but actually that's um, a bit of a lie as I've stated it. So standard warning, uh, this does not categorify the affine HECA algebra. Instead, this categorifies um, the group algebra of the affine file group. And so if you want to get um, the affine HECA algebra, you need to upgrade a little bit, you need um, to tack on the word mixed somehow, and there are different ways to do this. Um, yeah, but for our purposes, you're fine thinking of this as um, sort of a nice incarnation for the affine Hega algebra. And so, um, so then you might ask, well, what about the kajdan lustig basis? So the kajdan lustig basis appears um, as a collection of intersection cohomology sheaves. So these are indexed by the affine vowel group. And these are examples of perverse sheaves. So now I get to introduce my notation for perverse sheaves because I will use that later. This is a subcategory of this derived category. So this derived category is quite big and you need the whole thing in order to deal with the convolution structure. The convolution won't preserve this subcategory, but oftentimes when we're studying representation theory, you want to um, look at objects that fall in this subcategory called the perverse sheaves. And then sitting in here, we have this um, special kajdan lustig basis called the intersection cohomology sheaves. All right. Cool. So that's my um, that's my G side, and now let me tell you about the G check side. So on the G check side, instead of constructible sheaves, we study coherent sheaves. Um, and so here, the variety that I want to work with is called the Steinberg variety. So one way to um, define this is in terms of triples. So X here is a nilpotent um, in the Lie algebra. And then B1 and B2 are both Borel's. And then I have an incidence condition where X is in the, um, in the intersection. So this is the Steinberg variety. Uh, 
And it's not too hard to see when I write it down in terms of these triples that it comes with these maps, right? I can map myself um, to just the nilpotent. So I get a projection onto the nilpotent cone. Um, or I could project down to my Borels. So I have a map to two copies of the flag variety. Oop, this should be a check. Flag variety for G check. Um, or I could take the nilpotent and the Borel, and this gives me um, what is called the Springer resolution. If I just take this, then this um, identifies with the Springer resolution. So I could take the first Borel or the second. So I actually have two maps to the Springer resolution. And so using this structure, um, you can also realize this Dineberg variety as the, the fibered product with the Springer resolution um, with itself over the nilpotent cone. And then um, and then in this situation, um, we want to study coherent sheaves on this space. And then we want to also impose some sort of equivariance. And the equivariance, um, I could take just G check. But again, if I want to see the full, uh, if I want to see the structure of the affine Hecke algebra, then I also need an extra action of the multiplicative group. Eventually, I'll kind of forget about this multiplicative group. Um, but for now, let's keep it here. And these are coherent. All right, and this also comes with um, a monoidal structure. And it's also called convolution. I guess we don't have so many names for multiplication. Um, and so this time, the way that this convolution is defined is I take three copies of the Springer resolution. And now I can project um, in multiple ways to my Steinberg variety. Right, I can project down to the first two copies um, or the last two copies or the first and last copy. And so then I want convolution to be, well, I take, um, I take my sheaf on the Steinberg variety and I pull it back along, say the first map. And then I take another and pull it back along the last map. And then I can tensor product these together. And then I push it forward along the middle map. So that's my, uh, that's my convolution. All right, so if I'm in this category and I'm looking to see, and I'm looking to see the affine Hecke algebra structure, then it becomes much more difficult to see the kajdan lustig basis. Um, but what's easier is to see um, what is known as the Bernstein presentation. So the Bernstein presentation of the affine Hecke algebra is in terms of um, you have a collection of elements that correspond to the finite vial group and then you have um, a collection of not the standard basis but a collection of sort of twisted standard um, elements um, labeled by the coate lattice and they commute with each other. So to get the finite vial group, you look at the structure of the Steinberg variety and its irreducible components. Its irreducible components are just labeled by the finite um, vial group. Um, this isn't too hard to see. Um, I take my Steinberg, as, as I mentioned before, this maps down to two copies of the flag variety. And of course the G orbits here are indexed by the, the finite vial group. So I take a G orbit in here 
And then, um, yeah, this is a G orbit, not a closure. This is a G orbit. And then I take the pre image. And then I have to take the closure. And this is an irreducible component. And this is all of them. So that defines for me um, a closed variety um, that I could take the structure sheaf on, for instance. Um, and then to get the commuting elements that correspond to the coate lattice, um, you take some fullbacks um, of line bundles on the flag variety. So the line bundles on the flag variety um, just correspond to characters um, of the group G check. All right. So then the theorem, at least in characteristic zero, is that in fact these two categorifications are equivalent as categories. All right, um, so the hope for, for um, what I'm discussing today is to try to prove this in positive characteristic um, as long as the characteristic is not too small. Um, so that maybe we can um, utilize this understanding to, to better study our uh, modular representation theory. All right, good. Okay, so next I'd like to tell you about um, some progress in that direction. Um, so the progress is not an equivalence of, of these two categories, constructible sheaves and coherent sheaves, constructible sheaves on the affine flag variety, coherent sheaves on the Steinberg variety. Um, we're going to do something much simpler for today. So I have to tell you what the categories are. On the G side, um, I start with my perverse sheaves. Remember this has um, the collection of intersection cohomology sheaves labeled by the affine vial group. And those are actually the simple objects in this abelian category. So I can take a Serre quotient um, by some of them. So I just need to choose some irreducible objects that I want to kill. And I'm going to choose the one whose label W is, um, has positive length. So now I'll take the Sarah subcategory generated by these and take the quotient and we'll call this P0. So I'm killing quite a lot here. Most of these, most of these intersection cohomology sheaves have a label whose length is, is greater than zero, right? The only thing that's left are the IC sheaves whose uh, support is just a point in the affine flag variety. Um, so this is an abelian category um, and its irreducibles are the are exactly the ICs that I haven't killed. So this is exactly the number of connected components of the affine flag variety, which as I mentioned before, this is the size of the fundamental group. And then um, this category, this abelian category also has a monoidal structure, um, but Unlike the affine HECA category, this one is um, commutative. Um, but it, it's uh, defined in terms of the, of the convolution structure. So um, take two objects in the quotient. We'll put a bar over an object to indicate that it's um, in the quotient category. And when I convolve, in this quotient category, what do I do? I choose lifts of F and G in the category of perverse sheaves, convolve them. Now I've convolved these two objects and I'm no longer 
um, necessarily perverse anymore. So I have to do this perverse cohomology, which is just giving me um, a perverse sheaf out of this. And then I quotient again so that I land back in my P0. So that's my convolution. Uh, right. And so this, um, with this monoidal structure, um, it looks like you should have um, an abelian category with a tensor product. So this looks like it should be representations of a group. Um, and the problem um, is, is we'd like to be able to say this sort of thing, but the problem is just looking at P0, there's not an obvious fiber functor. All right, maybe I'll stop for a second. Are there any questions? Um, sorry, yes. Uh, so uh, what you've been calling the affine vial group, is that what others would be calling the extended affine vial group? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not totally confused. Yeah, no, that's a good question. That's a valid question. Other questions? But isn't this, this group is, it's just, it's some group of automorphisms of the Dinkin diagram, right? Oh, little, H? You're saying yeah. like it's for H? Yeah, isn't the, the number of length zero elements is very, is a small. Yeah, the number of length group. zero elements is very small, but this group um, is gonna be a little bit more complicated than, than that. I'll tell you what the group is. <laughs> yeah. I, Just, pi zero of your group will be pi one of G? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so let's see. Um, yeah, so let me tell you what the G check side, because this is, of course, the G check side is where our representation theory appears. So this is where the group appears. All right, so um, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna leave you in suspense any longer. So the group is um, the centralizer in the Langlands dual group of a regular Nilputin element. All right, so this group, um, yeah, I guess I could tell you what it looks like for SLN. If I'm looking at SLN, what is this group? Um, well, this is going to be a subgroup of a Borel and um, it has, of course, the centers in there. So I have some um, elements along the center. And then um, along my diagonals, I'm not allowed to just do anything. So this is the unipotent part, it has to be um, sort of the same element along each diagonal. So that's what this group is um, in, the, in the SLN case. So this group always has the form um, where it's the center of G check and then there's some unipotent stuff. So the, so the irreducibles of this group are exactly the, the characters of the center of the Langlands dual group. Um, yeah, so it might seem a little weird that this is appearing here. Um, so let me try to motivate this a little bit from the coherent sheaf side. Um, this category, I'll just uh, do G check equivariant. So the, this, this category um, is kind of difficult for me to understand. So instead I wanna replace it with a simpler category that I feel I have more uh, intuition for. So this category acts by convolution on just one copy um, on the Springer resolution. Okay, 
And so the Springer resolution, um, now I can play the same game where I take a, a sort of quotient um, by something. Okay, but geometrically what that quotient corresponds to is restriction. This is restriction to an open subvariety. So the open subvariety that I want to take, if I think about the Springer resolution, um, it's called the Springer resolution because it resolves the singularities of the nilpotent cone. And so the nilpotent cone um, has a biggest orbit called the regular orbit. And this is, you know, open, dense, smooth, it's homogeneous, right? And so since this is a resolution of singularities, it is an isomorphism over this open, dense, smooth thing. So this orbit identifies with an open subvariety inside the Springer resolution. So that's what I want to restrict to. I want to take this category where the affine Hecke category is acting and I want to restrict to this open bit and that plays the sort of role of restriction. So when I restrict, of course, this is the same thing as just looking at representations for the, for the stabilizer of this point, which in this case is the centralizer. All right, so that's the group um that's showing up on the on the dual side and now the theorem is that i have not led you astray and i'm saying this all for a good reason the theorem is that in fact these categories are equivalent as long as the characteristics not too small And so um, we'd like not too small to be something like a good prime, but that's not quite good enough. So we have to make a few more restrictions depending on the, um, on the types. Um, so I think I'll skip the um, specifics of that unless somebody is particularly interested in seeing the primes, um, I can write those down. So feel free to ask. Um, yeah, good. So, uh, questions, maybe? So, in type A, is bigger than the rank enough? Um, in type A, there is no, no restrictions. OK. All right, so. Um, maybe one other question. Um, yeah. So your restriction to the basic, I mean, to the open part, does this like when you said this is like quotient by something, is this like amount to quotienting by, by uh, support, like uh, by something like it's given support condition? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you could regard yourself as res um, just restricting sheaves to that big open part. Um, in terms of support, I don't want to say something in terms of support because the um, because the the um, yeah, I don't want to say something in terms of support. Um, I can say a corresponding thing in terms of. A, a T structure here. So this category has um, a T structure that's sort of like the perverse T structure, but unlike the perverse T structure, it is not defined in terms of the support of objects. Um, but within this T structure, um, you have um, some simple objects. Their labels will be um, not the affine vial group, but just the co-weight lattice. And so I can do a quotient by um, simple objects with the with the correct label. Um, 
but it's harder it's harder for coherent chiefs to say things in terms of um support there's lots of objects that have like full support that um sort of play different roles um like they play different roles in the category i guess is what i'm trying to say all right so um, now I'll tell you some ingredients for how this goes. Um, so the first ingredient is, as I mentioned, we don't have a fiber functor, so we need a sort of replacement. Just to get, um, just to be able to, to do some kind of Tanakian type formalism to get representations of a group. So this comes from um, this comes from some work that was already done long before um, this project started. Um, so this is um, the main tool that this uses is the um, Gates Gray central functor. And this is written down in terms of nearby cycles. Um, so the idea here is that um, I, I start with representations of the dual group. And this is already understood how to interpret this geometrically in terms of constructible sheaves. This identifies with um, perverse sheaves, not on the affine flag variety, but um, the what is called the affine Grassmannian, and I have to take some spherical perverse sheaves on the affine Grassmannian. This is called geometric Satake. Um, and so, and then this is the category where I can use the central functor, the nearby cycles, in order to get to perverse sheaves on the affine flag variety. And then, um, yeah, so this is where my replacement for the fiber functor comes from. So here I, um, let's go ahead and quotient to get to the category that we care about and call this composition um, Z bar. And so, so here I have my group already and here I have a tensor structure and you can show that this functor, um, respects the tensor structure. So all you need to do is show that Z bar, um, this is kind of vague, Z bar looks like a restriction functor. Restriction to a subgroup, right? So if I'm restricting to a subgroup, what kind of properties do I have? Well, for one thing, I don't, I don't kill any objects, right? Um, instead, I have this, um, kind of uh, faithfulness property. Um, so how do we see that? What this means, what you have to look for is that any object in P0 uh, can be realized as a subquotient of something. Coming from represent coming from representations of G check. Okay, so this this turns out to give you that um, faithfulness property, and so this tells you at least that this category is equivalent to representations of a group, and we get for free that this group is a subgroup of the dual group. All right. Um, so the second step is to see that this actually has something to do with um, something to do with the centralizer of a nilpotent or a unipotent element in the group. Um, so this comes from the fact that this functor Z, this functor um, has two variants. So the original, the original was due to Gates-Gurry, his nearby cycles functor, and then 
Chen Wen Zhu came along and wrote down a slightly different construction. It's a slightly different functor, but it satisfies the same properties. It's given by nearby cycles and it's, um, and it's a central functor. Um, and I, this is the one that we actually needed to use. So the, the important thing about nearby cycles is that whenever I look at nearby cycles, then I have this action of the monodromy. So this comes with a monodromy automorphism. So that means I get an automorphism of the functor um, and it's unipotent. So this gives me a unipotent uh, in the dual group. All right, so now um, H is a subgroup of it, um, of the centralizer of some unipotent, but we don't yet know that it's a full centralizer and we don't yet know um, that it's regular. So that's the, the next order of business. So to get that this is a regular unipotent element, um, this, uh, this is a little bit more technical. Points one and two were essentially known before this project was started. Bezer Kovnikov um, understood how to use Gates Corey's ideas to, to do this sort of thing. And um, so there was nothing new in steps one and two really. Although step one required a bit of work to extend it to positive characteristic. Um, so to prove that this element is regular, you, you have to study um, what are called Wakimoto sheaves. So I don't really wanna tell you what Wakimoto sheaves are, but if you're familiar with the affine Hecke algebra and the Bernstein presentation, um, then you know that there is usually the, the standard basis or you can use a Bernstein presentation where you have these um, commutative elements labeled by the co-weight lattice. And so the Wakimoto sheaves are the lifts of those objects. Um, these are certain perverse sheaves that are um, sort of like sitting in between standard and co-standard objects, if that makes sense. Um, or if, you're, if you like category O and you know about Verma modules, then there's also something called um, twisted Verma modules, so Wakimoto sheaves are sort of a geometric incarnation of those. Um, yeah, so the, um, what do I wanna tell you about this? I really don't wanna tell you anything about this. You have to find an extension of Wakimoto sheaves and the fact that this is um, non-split, um, force is a non-trivial action of the corresponding component. Um, in the action of the of this quotient of the Borel. Um, and so we have to have a component for each root. Um, so so the object that I look at is I take this representation, um, I'm making some assumptions so that this representation makes sense. So take the fundamental weight um, corresponding to the root alpha check, and then take the induced representation of this. This has a weight filtration, of course. Um, and, and from this representation, I can get a perverse sheaf right? Because I have gates Gurry's central functor, so I can get the perverse sheaf. Um, this is a central sheaf. And now this weight filtration corresponds to a Wakimoto filtration. Remember, I said that the Wakimotos were labeled by the co-weight lattice of G, which is the weight lattice of G check. Um, and so you can use... Um, you can use the structure of this perverse sheaf and the Wakimoto filtration to show that this 
this action has to be um, non-trivial and it corresponds to this non-split extension. And I think that's all I wanna say about that. Um, yeah, so this tells me that U is regular. And then finally, um, we wanna show that this group is the full centralizer and not just some subgroup. So, so for this, um, I have this cool lemma. So if you like representation theory, then maybe you'll enjoy this lemma. I thought it was cool. So if you have a group um, that, that contains the center, contained within the centralizer, we wanna, sh so we can show that we have at least the center because we can find um, the irreducible, op the irreducibles that correspond to the characters of the center, those are there. So we just need to show that it fills up the full centralizer. Um, and for this, we use tilting objects. So you look at your tilting objects and then naturally you can take the, the invariant um, of course, the invariance, since H is a subgroup, this will be a subspace of the invariance under the group H. And now if I know that in fact, these spaces are equal for every tilting object, then this implies um, that H has to be the full centralizer. Okay, so, so we have to prove this um, in terms of our geometry that our H um, sees, sees all. So the first thing that you use, um, here's some more representation theory, the invariance under the regular, <laughs> under the centralizer of the regular unipotent element, um, for some reason, this is kind of a cool fact, for some reason, this identifies with the zero weight space. So the dimension of the zero weight space of your representation is the same as the invariance. So this is true. Um, and then the, um, the zero weight space I can compute as a HOM geometrically. So this is a HOM in a category of perverse sheaves. Um, and so if you're familiar with perverse sheaves, um, well, even if you're not familiar with perverse sheaves, I told you that this central, the central object corresponding to this representation had a, had a filtration by Wakimoto's. So if I wanna see the zero weight space, then I take um, what would correspond to the, the Wakimoto um, labeled by zero. And then I have to do some stuff here to make this a true statement. So I have to actually put um, the Iwahori Whitaker stuff here um, to make this work out. All right. So, so once I do that, then there's a statement you can prove that says, in fact, this dimension uh, can be computed in the quotient category. Um, in the quotient, this corresponds to the image of a skyscraper sheaf, and we know what ZV corresponds to. It's just this Z bar V. Um, but this category we already recognized as being representations of H. So this is the HOM, H, um, yeah, H homomorphisms. The skyscraper sheaf corresponds to the trivial representation and ZV corresponds to V, just the restriction of V, right? So this is the, um, the H invariance, or I should say dimension. This is the same as the dimension of the H invariance of your space. All right. So that's the, um, yeah, so those are the main steps for, for proving our sort of um, part of the way to get to the affine Hecke category statement. 
And so the general hope um, is to upgrade this. Um, so we want to upgrade this to be able to prove um, a positive characteristic version of bezier kovnikov's theorem. Um, and so the, the, the way that we hope to do that is, is using some, some ideas of Sergal in his investigation of category O. He, um, he wanted to study category O in terms of Sergal bimodules and uh, modules for the covariant algebra um, and his, his Sergal functor V. And so we have a similar in a lot of ways set up um, so this, um, the P0 and representations of this centralizer, um, these sort of play the role of modules for the covariant algebra um, that, that shows up in, um, in circles, in circles um, investigation of category O. Yeah, so I think um, I think I still have some more time, but I don't think there's anything else I want to say. So I think I'm going to stop here and people can ask questions. Uh, great. Uh, th thanks very much for your talk. And um, uh, as Laura said, any questions? Can I ask, I seem to be confused about something basic. <laughs> so, say I was in SL2, then this H is, um, it's two copies of the additive group, if I understand right. If I'm in SL2, then I'm, it's just one copy of the additive group. Don't I have, a, I can put ones on the diagonal or I can put minus ones on the diagonal. And then I have a- uh, Ah, yeah, yeah, trying yeah. To... with the center, yes. Okay, so, um, but on the, the the number of the number of I simple the number of IC sheaves in P zero seems to me just to be two because there's only two elements of length zero in the affine bile group. Yes. But but the number of representations of the additive group is is uh, is larger, right? Yes. Uh, well, yes. Yes. So the the simple objects are easy to see. What's hard to see is the extensions of them in this, um, in the, on the constructible side, it's very difficult to, to come up with what should correspond to those objects. I see. Oh, okay, thank you, that helps me. Um, great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, we have a, a question in the chat from Tom Gannon um, that asking, uh, have you actually proved the lemma in, in, in this set of equations or are you just showing how you apply it? Oh yeah, the lemma is, is proven in, in our paper. The, the lemma for the, um, for the invariance. If the invariance of the subgroup match with the invariance of the full centralizer on tilting objects, then in fact, the subgroup has to be the full, the full centralizer. Okay. Great, thanks. Actually, I, I have a question of my own. Uh, okay. Uh, for, for possibly a very naive, silly question, um, but maybe this is the place for it. Um, uh, parity sheaves, do, do you see anything happening with parity sheaves under um, 
or hope for anything to happen to parity sheaves under these sorts of equipment? Ah, that's a good question. So somehow um, parity sheaves don't um, show up with what we're dealing with. Instead, what plays a big role is the um, tilting sheaves. Um, so if I'm if I'm working on the affine Grassmannian um, and I'm looking at geometric Satake, then then tilting and parity match there. But on the af in the affine Hecka category. Um, these are different. If I'm in the affine HECA category, I don't have tilting, um, but instead they show up um, in the what is called the anti-spherical module. So this can be realized as a quotient of the affine HECA category as well, but not you know not as severe of a quotient as the one that I presented. Um, or you can look at these Iwahori Whitaker um, sheaves, and so. So most of the tilting objects there are, to my mind, um, difficult and I don't know what they look like, but some of them are natural and they do come from geometric satake. So if I take the uh, a tilting representation for the dual group and then move it through Gatesquare's central functor, and then I don't stop don't stop at the affine Hecke category, but instead go to the Iwahori Whitaker category, then this will be a tilting object there. And so those do play, um, showing that those objects are in fact tilting is an important component of our proof. And it's also part of the reason for our restriction on, on primes, um, because the way we're able to do that is, while there are the easy, the easy tiltings, like the tiltings that are um, irreducible to begin with, those are easy to see that they will end up being tilting. And then there's also like a quasi minuscule weight that's easy to see that it, it will end up being tilting, but anything else is, is difficult. And so instead we use um, the tensor structure there to, to, get, um, to get the other tilting objects. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great. Um, yeah, any more questions? Well, uh, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Laura again and all the speakers today. And uh, I guess we will resume uh, tomorrow at um, 5 p.m. Uh, bond time which is 4 p.m. UTC and 11 a.m. Eastern and 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific time for people in the US and for other time zones, I can't convert that fast, uh, but you can find out. Anyways, see you tomorrow.